Greetings to YouTube. I'm sorry to do this to you, but here's two lazy rambling at the camera videos in a row. This pattern seems to occur with me often where I start making a kind of epic in-depth video that starts taking so long and there's so much stuff in it that I get antsy about the fact that I'm not releasing any videos and feel the need to record something. The video I'm working on now is a documentary about gamers. The ins and outs of games, all of the research, it's got multiple songs in it. It's got me standing in the rain looking emotional. It's got absolutely everything you could possibly ask for in a video. Wow! Actually, it's turning out so overwhelmingly epic that it's more like making four videos at once. So it might take a few weeks even. Hopefully not like two weeks. I don't want to oversell the timeline here to actually make the video. But when it's done, I'm sure I'll finally take my place in the pantheon of YouTube gods. In the meantime, here's just a little ramble on a topic that I've wanted to make a video about for a while but never got around to. And that is my political beliefs and I think the inherent tensions within them that I try to live with every day. I'm just a walking contradiction or as some might say, fucking sellout. Allow me to explain. I'm filming this bit afterwards but I realized I forgot to mention the title of this very video which is Left versus Leftist. Or am I going to call it Lefty versus Leftist? I don't know, we'll see. But as someone who's left-wing, I've always seen a distinction personally between someone who's left-wing on the left and a lefty and someone who is a leftist. People who are further left, that's what I say. To me, a leftist, and the right does not have this distinction at all. To them, we're all just leftists. To me, the cutoff point to leftism was abolish capitalism by perhaps any means necessary, perhaps advocating for that independent of what may be happening or the feasibility of that. And I don't want to start becoming condescending uh, about things, but I get seems like I am. <laughs> that that abolishing capitalism point is where left goes to leftism and that I personally don't think I am a leftist in that sense but I am very much on the precipice of looking at abolishing capitalism and thinking I wouldn't really have a problem with that if the alternative was good but I'm not really willing to take that step because I can't conceptualize or understand perhaps how that is just going to happen right now or what steps leftists think we have to take at this exact moment to kind of make that happen because it just seems so overwhelmingly far-flung and, and far-fetched to me given where we are in this current political and uh, economic zeitgeist but that's where I am sort of standing on the edge looking in to leftistism thinking that could be me I don't know could be me but I'm just not there right now I'm a fucking sellout and anyways that's the title of the video so going on to the fucking video that I recorded in the past which to you will seem like the future oh yeah I just want to mention that I googled leftist versus left wing versus left Nothing particularly came up. Although I did find some interesting bits and pieces. For example, this article from Current Affairs magazine, which as far as I can tell, is a left-wing progressive opinion and news outlet. The difference between liberalism and leftism. The article contains this section. It's also true that, according to one view, the differences between liberals and leftists are not even differences of substance, but differences of political strategy. The claim of people like Clinton and Blair is that while they share the core progressive principles of compassion and equality, they're simply more hard-nosed and pragmatic. They are more cynical about the limits of political possibility and believe that change happens slowly. From this perspective, the core difference between Clinton and Sanders is not their ultimate end goals. They both want a world of progressive values, but how to get there. And I certainly think a lot of people on the left and or leftists would totally disagree with this chunk of text because they would say Bernie Sanders is not a real socialist. He still wants to maintain capitalism. He's more on the Scandinavian model. He's a sock dem. He's into social democracy. And that Clinton is not really trying to get progressive values. He was pushing more for neoliberal capitalism capitalism with some element of welfare state and further down is this part but that's why I say the divide is something to do with one's view of political and economic institutions as either fundamentally good or not the liberal sees the conservative patriot wearing a flag pin and says a flag pin isn't what makes you a patriot the leftist says patriotism is an incoherent and chauvinistic notion which would make me a leftist because I'd be more likely to say the latter than the former the liberal says we are the real ones who love America while the leftist says what is America or I don't see what it would mean to love or hate a meaningless conceptual entity. I honestly think I would fall between those two things. To love a country is only meaningful in so far as what you decide that country is in its totality and what it is you're trying to love here. And a nation or a country is not, in my opinion, simply a meaningless conceptual entity. There are implications to it. So I wouldn't agree with either there. The liberal says, I am standing up for what the founding fathers actually believed. While the leftist says, the founding fathers endorsed the ownership of human beings. Some owned human beings themselves and beat or raped these human beings. I will not measure the worth 
of something by what the Founding Fathers thought about it. And there I would agree with the leftist again. Certainly the word liberal is an unfortunately overbroad and imprecise term, but it's fair to say that some strains of liberalism actually have more values in common with conservatism than with leftism, in that they affirm key conservative premises that leftists abhor, e.g. all that America is the greatest country in the history of the world poppycock. However, based on this, there are quite a few people that folks further to the left would say are liberal in the sense that they don't want to abolish capitalism and the underlying corruption power structure, they just want to reform and tinker with it, but share some of these ideas that patriotism is incoherent, the Founding Fathers had slaves, and that there is a ton of corruption in institutions. And yet, those people would not be considered leftists. But maybe you would call them progressives? So this writer, much like myself, seems to be basing the difference between liberal and leftist on their perception of the kinds of things that a liberal or a leftist might say or believe, which is hardly some kind of official seeming codified political theory. And I found a few other articles that mentioned a rift or divide between leftist and liberal. Or perhaps in my mind, some people on the left versus some people further on the left. A New York Times opinion piece by Nicole Saval called Hated by the right, mocked by the left. Who wants to be liberal anymore? States, liberal has long been a dirty word to the American political right. It may be shortened in the parlance of the Limbaugh bout to libs, or expanded to the offensive portmanteau libtards. But its target is always clear. For the people who use these epithets, liberals are basically every Everyone who leans to the left. Big spending Democrats with their unisex bathrooms and elaborate coffee. This is still how polls classify people, placing them on a neat spectrum from extremely conservative to extremely liberal. The article then goes on to discuss the rift on the left between liberals and leftists. Over the last few years though, and especially 2016, there has been a surge of the opposite phenomenon. Now the political left is expressing its hatred of liberals too. For the committed leftist, the liberal is a weak-minded, market-friendly centrist, wonky and technocratic, and condescending to the working class. The liberal is pious about diversity, but ready to abandon any belief at the slightest drop in poll numbers. The anonymous Twitter account liberalism.txt is a relentless stream of images and retweets that supposedly illustrate this liberal vacuousness, say the chief executive of Patagonia is being hailed as a leader of corporate resistance to Trump, or Chelsea Clinton's accusing Steve Bannon of fat shaming Sean Spicer. Slightly further, to be a liberal in this account is in some sense to be a fake. It's to shroud an ambiguous, even reactionary agenda under a superficial commitment to social justice and moderate incremental change. American liberalism was once associated with something far more robust, with a moderate presidents and spectacular waves of legislation like Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal and Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. Today's liberals stand accused of forsaking the clarity and ambition of even that flawed legacy. To call someone a liberal now, in other words, is often to denounce him or her as having abandoned liberalism. But in this article as well, a distinction between liberal and leftist is barely elucidated in any way. It's just sort of mentioned in passing. I also found an article in the National review leftism is not liberalism by dennis prager which was a bunch of trash skip so i think i've gotten this distinction of just somewhere in the left wing versus leftist from my just experiences talking to more left-wing people than me and seeing the interactions on Twitter and online. So it's very much just an experiential definition and distinction. I don't know if it's an official thing at all, but people always talk about it. They say leftist, a liberal is not a leftist. And I guess I've kind of internalized that. I officially class myself as a progressive liberal. I can already hear people laughing. On the left, they're saying both of those are cancerous because they both support and back up capitalism. Progressivism was basically just a huge expansion of government services in order to help the poor, but it's still part of a capitalist mode. It's basically just changing the tax system and redistributing uh, through those means to provide the basic necessities of life and healthcare, things like this. It's still just a bunch of capitalism. It's still just corruption, you fucking sellout. And liberalism was just the ideology which actually gave rise to the economic system of capitalism because it was liberal philosophers like Adam Smith and John Locke and others who came up with the ideas that transformed from the era of classical liberalism into liberalism today, which just went down its logical path into laissez-faire capitalism and neoliberalism. So liberalism is entirely economically cancerous and has no concerns for inequality and global global economic imperialism. It has no way of addressing exploitation by capitalists of the working classes 
because it is part of that very system of capitalism which it helped create. So Tim, when you call yourself a progressive liberal, you're basically just saying, I want an exploitative welfare state, an attempt to redistribute resources through taxes while the oligarchs and plutocrats and the powerful and the rich maintain their stranglehold on everything and the corruption and outsourcing and inherent flaws of the system are perpetuated, you fucking sellout scumbag. And on the right, particularly in the political zeitgeist we're in today, they would say, Progressive liberal. Liberals cannot be progressive because progressivism is cancer. It's all about SJWs with blue hair yelling about how they want cultural Marxism. You want everyone to be trans. You want to put trans people into bathrooms. You just want to get triggered and offended. You fucking SJW. And liberalism was never about that. Liberalism was about freedom. Liberalism was about free speech, exchange of ideas. And that is not compatible with progressivism. Progressives struck me as liberals, but louder. Progressives were the nice guys. They looked out for the little guy. They cared about women and minorities. They embraced change. In short, who wouldn't want to be a progressive? But over the last couple of years, the meaning of the word progressive has changed. Progressives used to say, I may disagree with what you say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. Not anymore. Banning speakers whose opinions you don't agree with from college campuses, that's not progressive. Prohibiting any words not approved of as politically correct, that's not progressive. Putting trigger warnings on books, movies, music, anything that might offend people, that's not progressive either. All of this has led me to believe that much of the left is no longer progressive, but regressive. Damn, you just been pwned. This is one of the reasons I've spent so much time on my show talking about the regressive left. Pwned. I can no longer call myself a progressive. I don't really call myself a Democrat either. I'm a classical liberal, a free thinker. Amazing. I remember living through the period of the 2000s, 2008-ish, where Fox News was on a mission to make liberal into a dirty word. Liberal was a far-left person, somebody who was just totally bonkers, off the edge of the left. Hated freedom, hated discussion, was always offended by everything, hated Christmas. And after that, when people like Dave Rupin or Sagan McCard came along and reclaimed the word liberal for classical liberalism, that all changed, and they don't demonize the word liberal anymore, at least not to that extent. Certain personalities, of course, still do that, because I feel like that's quite ingrained at a place like Fox News. But from like 2000 to 2008 ish, liberal was about the dirtiest word that the right had. And now they've kind of backed off that. Just interesting. But now many on the right, I think, would say that a progressive liberal cannot be because a liberal can't be a progressive and vice versa. So why am I going around calling myself a progressive liberal? A labor which is going to do me no favors with basically anybody I know. It's going to leave everybody unsatisfied. People on the left will bash me for that. People on the right will bash me for that. And then people that I can actually discuss what I really think with maybe a little bit more understanding about it. The thing about basically all political terms is that fucking hell cat, stop it. The thing about basically all political terms is that there are different ways and different contexts in which you can think about what the terms mean. There is the technical meaning and understanding of a word. And when I think about the technical meaning of progressive or liberal. I wasn't entirely satisfied with how I explored the technical meaning of the word progressive, so I decided to do a little bit of research and record a section about it separately. Before its more political usage, it was basically just talking about modernization, moving away from savagery and moving towards civilization, which could have all kinds of colonial implications to it. But it wasn't really before the 20th century that progressive started developing into what we really see it as today. I think a good early document to look for in how progressivism was formed in its modern conception is in the very unfortunately named New Nationalism of Theodore Roosevelt, which was his progressive political platform during the 1912 election. The nationalism in question here, I think, was talking about focusing on the development internally and domestically of the United States for the sake of the poor and working class. But obviously, particularly over the course of the 20th century, nationalism has come, rightfully, to have extremely negative connotations. And obviously, I would strip that part out of it today. Anyways, the New Nationalism 
minimalism progressive platform of 1912, despite its also a problematic nature, does contain many of the roots of progressive thought. For example, socio-economic policy, a national health service to include all existing government medical agencies, social insurance to provide for the elderly, the unemployed and the disabled, limited injunctions and strikes, which basically means preventing court orders that infringe on people's right to strike, a minimum wage law for women, an eight-hour workday, a federal securities commission, farm relief, workers' compensation for work-related injuries, an inheritance tax, which is one of the rich's most hated taxes, and a constitutional amendment to allow a federal income tax, women's suffrage, direct election of senators, primary elections for state and federal nominations. The main theme of the platform was an attack on what he perceived as the domination of politics by business interests, which allegedly controlled both established parties. The platform asserted that to destroy this invisible government, to dissolve the unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. To that end, the platform called for strict limits and disclosure requirements on political campaign contributions, registration of lobbyists, recording and publication of congressional committee proceedings. I definitely think this area could go a lot further, and progressives today do propose much more stringent anti-corporatocracy proposals, but hey, it's a good start. So what really stood out about this platform is that it stood against corporatocracy, basically. It was all about redistribution of wealth through taxes. It included things that at the time were seen as radical even by other progressives such as Woodrow Wilson, such as women's suffrage, and it had very little of the concern that liberals show, even in this day and age, for the well-being of extremely rich people. And the fact that they'll have to give more back in order for society to actually flourish. So putting aside all of the hideous things of that day and age that progressives also bought into, I understand that for example Woodrow Wilson, one of the big proponents of progressivism, was an extreme racist who resegregated the White House, who said in 1914, segregation is not humiliating, but a benefit and ought to be so regarded by you gentlemen. He also lied about being for women's suffrage and women's right to vote and did nothing about it for a whole term and just stood in the way of the protesters and activists fighting for the vote. So it doesn't matter if Woodrow Wilson was called a progressive, he was a racist who stood against Ooh, progress. Anyways, suck. the new nationalist, those ideas are kind of the root of modern progressive politics. I'm not going to go into as much depth on liberalism, but I will say what's often seen as a foundational text of liberalism was John Locke's Two Treaties of Government published in 1689. Some key ideas from the text are the idea that the law of nature is not fit to govern and that men must join in society with others who are already united or have a mind to unite for the mutual preservation of their lives, liberties, and estates. He criticizes the excessive power of kings and doesn't talk of abolishing monarchy, but does talk of a civil society and government. And was also pro-revolution, something that today's classical liberals would probably be a little bit too wussified to get behind. They seem to prefer just sucking up to the powerful. So that's a bit of a difference between the old classical liberals and the current classical liberals. To John Locke, revolution has a place. So I would say of this core text of liberalism that the sort of key thrust of it is individualism, which is something that you can see as a big talking point and piece of rhetoric for liberals today and quote unquote classical liberals today. Rankers. It's not hard to see how that focus would turn into capitalism. And I would also say that conversations around freedom of expression, free speech, free exchange of ideas, open markets, etc. all stem from this idea of individualism, which had primacy in the theories of liberalism. When I think of liberalism, I absolutely do think more about capitalism. I do think more about the fact that it is an ideology that fetishizes freedom. And the issue with that, I think, is when you extend free freedom throughout your ideology and you're met with things that can't really be as free as you would like them to be because they're actually a threat. Nazism, for example, or extreme inequality created by a system of economics, which is just, to be honest, too free. It's not reined in enough. It does not help people at the bottom and there is no way of stopping this extreme systemic inequality from occurring which starts damaging human beings and I'm also a humanist so that's not good for me. That's when I start totally empathizing with and understanding the anarchist and the communist and the leftist and the further left and the lumping them all together bunch of folks over there 
point of view about it. So there's the technical theoretical way of thinking about these terms. And then there is the way that they are used in everyday parlance and how they develop over time and just throughout recent history as well. You know, from being online even and just seeing the ways that people use these phrases and the way people organize themselves into groups and into different cliques based on these words. The different ideas that can fall under these umbrellas that weren't originally conceived of when the phrases were come up with. That's another way of thinking about it. And through that way of thinking about it is where I really get my personal understanding of being a progressive. In my everyday life when I think of progressivism I don't think of like the progressive era and necessarily welfare. What I think of is a progressive spirit and that sounds quite cheesy and corny. But I think the ultimate human good for me, caveats to come, is progress. Which immediately makes you have to think, what is progress? What does that mean? Well, the way that I think about progress is what helps the most amount of people in the most possible ways to live the best possible lives that they could. And that's not capitalism. I don't know if it's necessarily socialism, perhaps in the perfect socialist utopia. I know that might seem a little bit insulting to socialists, but it's hard to imagine a kind of socialist system exactly as they want it in reality, because that hasn't been seen that often, perhaps at times throughout history, but seeing a modern, I mean, I don't know if they believe in a country, depends on the socialist, I guess, seeing a modern anarchist situation, I don't I don't know if I could call it a government, whatever you wish to call it, collective way of coping with being humans on this planet. Perhaps in that exact state and situation, that would be the ultimate in progress. So for me, would be the greatest progressive idea of all time. This fantastic socialist situation, but without being able to see that really come to fruition just in life, just by looking around yourself and seeing the state of the world, what I tend to advocate for in terms of progress is things that I think can really happen right now. And it's not just this big revolution of people fighting for a total overhaul of a system, which would be great to overhaul and it would be fantastic to do, but it's not necessarily the thing which is going to create progress at this exact moment. That's what I really advocate for, and I kind of differentiate that between what my perfect state of being would be and what I think I really want to fight for right now. For example, bolstering a healthcare system as much as you possibly can in the current zeitgeist is progressivism as far as I'm concerned. But it's not like an overhaul of everything. And somebody was arguing with me today, well, you know, Scandinavian countries are not actually socialist, which is something I totally agree with. I was kind of mistaken on that previously and I thought they were, but I don't think paying taxes in order to receive a service with better access and reduced cost is really socialism in the technical sense. But they were kind of deriding those systems somewhat and saying they still have inequality quality. They still have the corruption of capitalism. They still have poor people. They still have people who go hungry. They still have people who suffer. To which I responded, then yeah, then they should have even stronger welfare in that situation. And the rich should indeed pay more taxes so that they do have things like guaranteed health care, guaranteed housing. I would even say guaranteed clothes and food. Yes, if I ran the government, maybe I would provide an allowance for clothes and food. I'd say those are subsidized, here you go. Here's some money, go buy some food. Maybe a lot of their bills would be paid for them. And a lot of those companies would have to cede worker control. My utopia world would actually be pretty socialist. Maybe not as socialist as some people would want, but I would do a lot of things that would make hard right or right wingers heads explode. But he was kind of glossing over the fact that Scandinavian countries having guaranteed coverage for people, despite it not being the perfect socialist system is such a massive boon to the citizens versus being in a piecemeal system like in America where you just have to deal with private insurance, you don't have any guarantee, it costs too much, and you could fucking die or be put out of business or lose your livelihood or lose everything or lose your home. You could be decimated by healthcare costs. The difference there is massive and you can't just pretend like because it's not the socialist revolution, we're gonna dismiss it because it's not real socialism or because it's not socialist enough for me, or socialist at all. All I care about is the fucking ideological purity. You can't fucking say that. Like, there is an actual difference in people's lives. And I think that is one of the cutoff points between progressives and anarchists and socialists and communists, and again, me lumping all those people together, is that they often put ideological purity above thinking that you can actually do things to improve people's lives, even if it's not gonna be perfect. And thinking that they have to go out and be fucking warriors all the time, they're not necessarily thinking about what the 
like everyday person is kind of going through and what they're trying to cope with. They just want to go out and rumble with the fucking fascists, which is fair enough. I mean, fuck the fascists. But when you take off your warrior outfit and you come home and you sit down, I don't know what really gives you the right to say, you are shit, everything you think is bad, and you just love corruption, and you love perpetuating all the worst things in the world. And I'm saying that because you're not as pure as me. I put on a mask and I go out with my sticks and I make a bunch of noise and I get angry at people online saying that they don't want my socialist utopia. Advocate for those things. It's perfectly fine. I have no problem with that. I have no issues with people to the left of me and I welcome it and actually really like it seeing people have these much more lofty ideas. And I don't even say that in a way like I'm completely dismissing that. The only thing that I'm saying is, you know, it's time and place kind of thing. You got to figure out what makes sense in the moment. I think a lot of people to the left of me have their heads a little bit in the clouds in that sense. I do think I'm a little bit more cynical and pessimistic. I don't exactly have a rosy outlook on life, so I'm probably not the right person to look to about that. There's nothing wrong with being idealistic. I just take issue with the fact that you think it makes you better than me. Normally it doesn't. It just makes you really hard to talk to because you don't listen. And you just get constantly enraged about how people don't have this exact specific narrow idea of what is important to advocate for at this exact moment. It doesn't become just a placeholder for a different kind of corruption, which is what tends to happen. And so much more of a defender of the rights of marginalized people, even though you're not necessarily doing anything more than I'm doing, just making YouTube videos perhaps. That's the thing that I tend to resent. So coming back to progressivism, I had somewhat appropriated the term for myself in a sense. I totally acknowledge that. And I don't expect other people to just understand what I'm talking about when I use that in reference to myself, which is why I'm making this video. It is the fight for whatever it is that could help the most amount of people at this exact moment right fucking now. And I'm sure that the thing that could help people the most right fucking now would be abolishing capitalism. The problem is you can't just magically abolish capitalism. If you could, I probably, I wouldn't mind if the alternative was better. Sounds fine. And I have no problem with progressivism being used as kind of the spearhead to lead to a socialist utopia. I'd have no problem with that. If my progressivism turned into Marxism and the Marxism worked and it was great, and it helped a lot of people's lives. Why would I have an issue with that? I'm not a right-wing reactionary who would say, but oh my God, Marxism's bad. Everyone's always told me that he's a terrible man. Look at his beard. Marx has killed trillions throughout history. Everything that bad that's ever happened in history was his fault because of his theories. It had nothing to do with the corrupt people. It all had to do with him. I don't believe that. I think Marx was an economist who had many interesting ideas who also advocated for communism, which for him was, I guess like my idea of progressivism, somewhat particular to his vision of it, and it would not have been carried out to this point in history as he envisioned it. Sorry, it's hot today, I'm sweating. But I also know that people further to my left would totally reject that because they say, your beliefs are inherently corrupt, you love capitalism, you're going out with the garbage. You're impure, no, no progressivism, you leave. So it doesn't matter how welcoming or open I am to the ideas of socialism or communism. I get the bullet. Like, it's just irrelevant what I think. And then people on the right, they're going to call me a communist anyways. So I can't fit in with the commies and I can't fit in with the commie haters. I got nowhere to be. I'm all alone. And liberal. Why do I call myself a liberal? Which is just the ultimate sellout thing to be at this point, especially because classical liberals try to make a comeback and they're just fuck-headed right-wing libertarian laissez-faire scumbags who just want to stamp on the faces of poor people. Why would I associate myself with those fucks? And here's the reason. I understand that this explanation of why I'm a liberal is going to sound incredibly fucking pathetic. Inherently, liberalism is a pathetic ideology. It's toothless, it's spineless, it's weak, it has no defense against fascism, it totally caves in and crumbles. And I've seen many people who are liberals constantly crumbling. One example is Cenk Uygur talking to Tucker Carlson, a well-known fascism spreader who's obsessed with fear-mongering about people who have different skin colors crossing the border in order to distract people away from Donald Trump's authoritarian agenda. Cenk had a conversation with Tucker Carlson. Tucker was like, you know, I'm very open-minded. I'm very interested in what you're saying. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow, I actually think we agree on a lot of stuff. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I think corporations are too powerful. I think progressivism has a lot of good ideas, actually. I think what we need in America today is a productive exchange of ideas in such a polarized time, and that's why we're convening this discussion tonight. So let's bring them out first. Make some noise for the founder and host of the Young Turks, Cenk Uygur. <laughs> All right, thank you. I love Politicon. <laughs> All right, and please also welcome the host of Tucker Carlson tonight on Fox News. 
Tucker Carlson. I'm going to really try to be as sort of civil and polite as I can, and maybe my mind will be changed because in this world things are changing so fast. Why wouldn't your mind change? Um, so maybe you can change my mind. I would say on the question of this group of migrants coming north, the one that came three months ago coming north. All right, so let's break it down. Um, and backstage, uh, we had far too much agreement, so let's break that up. Um, so. I, I kind of, let me just say, I kind of agree with some of that, unexpectedly, but I, th I think you're right. I mean, I, I don't blame really immigrants for anything. As people, the policies are not formulated by them. The question is who benefits. I don't ever speak in dog whistles because I can say whatever I want, and I always do. So I, so I appreciate the question because I'm often attacked on the basis of, you know, maybe something, and it, it's probably my fault for not explaining whatever it was fully, but let me just say, nothing is in code, okay? <laughs> it's all right out there. I don't actually think that there's a real, I mean, look, I, appreci I sincerely appreciate this because I, I like an actual adult debate with a smart person about this, but I see that so rarely. And what I love about it is we didn't mention Trump at all. Uh, during that, and so I think that's a good indicator that we're getting deeper into the issues here. So I don't want people to him take him conceding points as a sign of weakness. I think it's a sign of intellect and and having a conversation. Now, on the other hand, Tucker says terrible things on the air, so I'm I'm conflicted by that, and I'm just keeping it real. Yeah. But it was I have to confess that it was. Nice to talk to a non-robot. I I enjoyed this debate so much more because it was it's Tucker Carlson's a mystery. I know exactly what I'm going to get with Dinesh D'Souza as a really sad, pathetic man who's going to do the same exact talking points. Charlie Kirk, every time he does a debate with Hassan Piker, as he did a Politicon twice now and with others. My favorite conspiracy theory from someone who works here is that he's trying to red pill you guys. That is seeming to agree with you guys, so you'll watch him and then you'll buy into his point about uh, immigrants being bad and how we gotta have one culture here. But if you watch him, his rhetoric is. Wow, Tucker Carlson was so open minded. He was really listening to me. You know, I think you think maybe he's a different person than all of us thought, at least what I thought. I think you're gonna love this discussion. It's really just an interesting discussion. And I was just sat there thinking, like, Jank, you fucking bonehead. You got completely bamboozled. He just did this snake oil salesman sweet talk on you, pretended like he agreed with you on a lot of stuff so that he could win you over. You fucking fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. That is the stereotypical example of liberals being weak and stupid and naive because they think, oh, we just have a nice little conversation about things. We just have a discussion about why other people are subhuman. And the person on the other side's like, I'll just disarm you by being polite and acting like all of that shit that I say every day, acting like brown people are parasites, just to act like I don't say all that stuff and then I'm actually just a populist person who is just really concerned about the poor and I want to fight the oligarchs. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. If you've been watching the other channels lately, there is at least one thing you've learned about the caravan of Central American migrants currently marching toward our southern border. The whole thing is no big deal. These are nice people, every single one of them much better people than you are. They have the deep moral authority that comes from living in a third world country, unlike you, Mr. Pampered Suburbanite. They're not invaders, they are future model Americans. There is nothing at all to worry about, we're told. Well, that's been the chorus from politicians and news anchors who think they're politicians for weeks and weeks now. If you have any concern at all about this caravan, you are a bad person. In fact, you, sir, are a racist. No, be afraid, be very afraid. And hey presto, wow, Tucker Carlson's a great guy. No, Jane Tucker Carlson's not a great guy. He's basically like, he's just this dunderhead idiot that I can use for my own ends to spread my message. You know, now people will say, oh, I really want to see what this Tucker Carlson's about. And it can just be a gateway into authoritarian fascism, basically. And Jake illustrated the spinelessness and lack of moral conviction of liberalism. I hope that wasn't his progressive side, because if so, then I'm in trouble.
because progressivism needs to have a spirit of fighting. It, it can't just be sitting back and saying, I'll take you at face value, even though I know the kind of person you are, because I can see it every fucking day in your TV show. And I just realized I haven't even got to why I call myself a liberal, because I spent so much time bashing liberals. All right. Here's the pathetic reason that I call myself a liberal. Because, like, can't we just all get along, man? Let's be friends. La-dee-da. Let's have a society where we all talk and we all chat and we can just work out our problems. That's what it should be all about. It's all about free speech and conversation. Woo. Yes, for me, it's just basic hippie shit. Like, that is the reason that I'm a liberal. Because I know other ideologies and other ideas, they do have free speech. They do have open dialogue. They do have the idea of just trying to work through your problems, man. Like Neville Chamberlain. But I don't think any ideology has really encapsulated it as much as liberalism. As flawed as that is, as weak as it is, as vulnerable as it is, as exploitable as it is, I see that as a necessary evil. You have to have a valve whereby people try to sort out their issues through conversation, debate, dialogue, and conferencing. And that is kind of the spirit of liberalism. It's always been about live and let live. If you put aside, and it's hard to do this, because it's such a major problem, the inequality and horrible side effects um, of wider liberal thought. And that actually brings it full circle as to why I call myself a progressive liberal and not just a liberal. Because if I just call myself a liberal, no, that's no good. That would be just like being Jenk Yuga talking to Tucker Carlson 24-7. Alt-right Nazis, hey, let's just chill out, let's have chats. I've seen some people I know who do that recently, which is disgusting. You shouldn't just have casual chats with alt-right Nazis. You, you know who they are. You know what they advocate. You know they want white ethnostates. I don't know if it's just for exposure, where some people go on their shows, because they just want people to like them. But no, fuck that. You should have convictions. But if I was just a liberal, what would prevent me from being like that? And I'm not just a progressive, because I'm not just about a fighting spirit. I'm also about tolerance within reason. And I think with a combination of those two things, my idea of what progressivism is, which is really just that fighting spirit. It wasn't progressive of Jenk to allow a fascism spokesperson to walk all over him because that's not furthering human progress at all. That's just furthering intolerance. That's just helping Tucker Carlson. But I'm not just about only fighting everything all the time. I'm also about trying to have dialogue wherever you can, trying to bring people around, trying to convince people. That's another part of me. So the liberal part of me is the part that tries its hardest to appeal to people and talk to people and try to work stuff out. And the progressive side of me is the one that says, pull the plug, this is not working, fuck this. It's time to, figuratively in most cases, not all cases, I mean, they used to fucking kill Nazis. It's time to figuratively, perhaps, punch you in the fucking face now. The time for playing nice is over. We wanna fight for what actually helps humanity and helps people. And when we say humanity, we mean all of those people that you want to discriminate against. We mean gay people, trans people, minorities, different religions and ethnicities. We don't just mean white people. We don't just mean your shitty fucking ethno state. We can't roll with that. The liberal part has got to go now. Goodbye. We tried that. That didn't work. And then maybe when we get back to a situation where everything's not quite so fucked up, the liberalism can roll back in and we can have a nice little chat. And that's the way I see it. For me, progressive is much more of a spirit. Not necessarily of activism, but just a general way of approaching things where you fight for what you believe. You don't just roll over. You don't just say, oh, you're being polite to me, and you see an opportunity for exposure or access to something or, you know, some audience. Then I'm willing to say I'm a progressive liberal. I'm someone who will be nice to you within reason, but I fight for what I believe in, so with the full knowledge of the kind of shit that you advocate for, I'm not just gonna sit down and play patsy with you. That's just opening the gate to intolerance. Hey, people who hate non-white people come come on in let's let's party let's have fun fuck all these other people who might not be comfortable with that i'm a liberal everyone's welcome no that's not the way i'm wrong that's my totally inadequate explanation of my own belief system feel free to rip it to shreds and tell me how wrong i am in the comments section to my further left friends and or haters i do have a question for you which is practically moving towards this idea of a revolution or abolishing capitalism what are the first steps and stages of that how can we do it and am i allowed to assist you in any way as a progressive liberal or do i get the bullet is it workers taking more control of companies is it direct democracy so to speak what are the first steps how do we get there let's do this Oh